Hello everyone and welcome to the Matthew Marsden Show. This is an interview I have wanted to do for such a long, long, long time. I can't tell you how excited I am to have my friend Dave Van Vickel on the show. How are you doing, Dave? Great. Thanks for having me on. Great. Good so, uh, no, no, it's my, my absolute pleasure. I, um, I heard Dave speak at, uh, it was a year ago now, just over a year ago at um, my kid's school at a gala that we put on, or gala, 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 potato, Whatever. potato, yeah, I don't know. Right. But anyway, I mean, and, and uh, Dave is, is one of the best public speakers I've ever heard. Um, but he wasn't speaking at this point about his real area of expertise. And I'm just going to get straight into it, Dave. I want you <laughs> to um, tell the audience a little bit about yourself and how sure. you got into this area, because I think, it is it is utterly fascinating. I think a lot of people just dismiss it as uh, hocus pocus. Um, sure, sure. So anyway, off you go. I'm I'm going to yeah. give the floor to you, right? I uh, know I'm an actor. Yeah. I like to talk, so I'm going to give the floor to you. Sure, sure, no worries. Um, yeah. So I had a, a very serious conversion experience when I was young, like 14 years old. Um, I gave my life to the Lord, and I was um, very serious about it, and had a real relationship with God at that age. Um, and it was intense and everything. And a priest friend of mine who was very close to me, he was like a spiritual director. He um, really kind of took me under his wing a little bit. And I didn't know it at the time, but he was an exorcist. And at this time, you know, we're talking about 25 years ago, right? Or 20 years ago, there was like, maybe nine exorcists in the whole of North America. Like it would just was not a thing anymore. It was, they were all over the age of 70, pretty much. Uh, most people were not uh, practicing it anymore. Uh, if you needed can, help from, yeah. Can you say, ahead. can you say why Dave, like why that, why that sure, is? Sure. Sure. Yeah. I think, well, I mean, the, the, the short story is this, that text critical theology, scripture theology crept into seminaries and crept into theology and what they were doing was kind of like reading the bible without any supernatural meaning behind it so i don't know if you remember this era in the church where sometimes you'd hear the gospel of the loaves and fishes and and the, the interpretation would be well people shared the loaves and fishes that was yeah. the miracle right yeah well you can imagine if you're willing to interpret that gospel passage in that way that anything to do with the devil is going to be gone way before that right and so famously there was a scripture scholar or a theologian in italy who wrote a book in i want to say the 70s this was like kind of the pinnacle of this happening um it was called the devil my brother and he basically reinterpreted scripture and said look the devil is just like it's like a, a fanciful figure that we've used we've created to describe all of the world's evil um, so it would be, in, for instance, like like in paganism, right? Like, you know, they 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 attribute godlike powers to to things like that. He was saying that that's what Christians are doing. Okay, well, obviously, you and I know that's a ridiculous interpretation of scripture. It's it, impossible to hold the resurrection without holding the fact that God created these things called angels, and that one of them fell and brought many with them. Right? Those kinds of things. So that theology really crept in and it got to the point where people were not practicing exorcisms and bishops were not appointing exorcists. Um, people didn't really believe in it anymore. And then in 1998, I think about Pope John Paul issued a motu proprio saying like, look, every diocese has to appoint someone because what was happening is anyone who was struggling with something that they believed to be demonic, they were not finding help in their own country. So they were going to Rome and, and knowing that there were exorcists there that would help them. And the Roman exorcists were basically like, look, we can't deal with all these problems. So you have to appoint people. And that's when it started happening, but no one knew how to do it at that point because it had fallen out of practice. So, um, yeah, so that was kind of where, where we were at when it, I started it's, um, at that, at that time. It's amazing. So, look, for, first, I just want to take you back a wee bit on up a the idea of the devil, because I feel that, sure. you know, we, we, we've, we've kind of 
we've most people actually poo-hoo the idea of the supernatural firstly that they, they just right. say you know this doesn't exist i, I did um a video with my friend Jim Burnham the other day about the the proof of the uh, immaterial soul. Right. And the reason why I wanted to do that was because we have become so reliant on science. Um, right. And, and, and uh, like, I'm I genuinely like, over reliant on science that so anything, right. anything outside of that is, is, is not real. We don't, you know, even to the point where any can, if you look on the comments and people who are watching this can go and look at the comments that my friend is a philosopher and obviously philosophy talks about the things that are outside of the material world for the most part, right? Like the big right. ideas, big things. And, and they're just like poo hooed immediately. Like, Oh, you know, that you're just ridiculous. You're talking about the flying spaghetti monster and all this. Right. And I think, I think the, the amazing thing about what we're going to talk about and what you're going to talk about in a little while is this is when, when you have the tangible, Right, the things that you can really point to that are unexplainable. And for me, when you meet someone who's a real person who has seen these things and experienced these things, it just becomes that much more real. And then you have to go back and look at, well, hang on a minute, what is the explanation for this, right? Because there are certain explanations you just you just can't explain. All people will go, oh yeah, I don't believe in that. That's not real. But discussing spiritual things right um is is something that's gone on for all of human history it's only relatively recent history that people are going oh well you know no there's no such thing as spirit and there's no right. you know the evil doesn't exist really it's just like what you don't like or you know, what, what, what whatever it might be we kind of like explain it away and i think that that's doing a massive disservice in the church clearly was doing a massive disservice back then to kind of attribute any kind of evil to just things that you don't like, right? Like, right. or you, you, someone right. doing something that is against a set of rules rather than something way, way, way deeper. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I think like, to be fair, um, I'm a Christian who wrestles, right? Like, I mean, I have, like, my faith is, is I, like, I would say I like to think it's strongly held, but like, I'm, I've questioned my faith on numerous occasions, right? I mean, that's what we're supposed to do in a certain yeah. sense. And, and, and like, I think a lot of people think that my studies in philosophy, theology, or whatever are to help other people, but they're not apologetic in form. It's because I want to understand things that science couldn't, couldn't answer, right? They, 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 it just couldn't contain it. And so it's not lost on me that this is strange and weird. And I would say I'm probably more skeptical than most of the skeptics who come to my talks, you know? So, yeah, it's funny. It's funny that yeah. because, you know, I, I say that all the time to people that I, talk, I wish I had that kind of faith. I wish yeah. I had the faith that I, I, I was all of a sudden like overwhelmed with this amazing fuzzy light and I felt all warm you know what I mean? And all of a sudden yeah. it was clear and I don't doubt. And, and every single day I live my life like God is real. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I think most right. of us don't. And so for me, um, it, it, I'm, I'm, I would say so I'm a logic and reason person. Like I, yeah. I came yeah. to my realization about faith through really through Aquinas. I mean, like the first book I read right. that really turned me on to it was The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. And that right. was a very factual approach yeah. to yeah. to you know whether or not Jesus was a real historical figure and what did that mean if he was and right. then uh, and then the revelation is you you know you start like picking away and then you see that people have been writing about this stuff for years and years and years and years and Thomas Aquinas for me was the real uh, the, the real nuclear bomb that made me go oh hang on a minute like right. I didn't even know this existed. Right. And it, you kind of get, for me anyway, I got very, very angry that nobody came and told me this like back in the day and yes. explained it to me. And then when, you know, even when I, you know, you, you know this, when we go out and we talk about Thomas Aquinas' five proofs and, and for the people that don't know, at some point I'm going to get into that so you can really understand it. One of the most frustrating things about that is the straw man arguments against it, right? That, right. that they'll say, you know, 
uh, oh, you say that everything has a um, beginning, right? Oh, everything has a beginning. Well, you know, does God have a beginning? Right? And then, no, 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 no. That's not what the argument is, right? right? right. So, and, and we need to have philosophy to answer these kind of questions. Right. And to me, that's how I came to my faith. And dude, it's a struggle every single day. You know, right. I, I, right. I'm, I was, you know, the, the, the church is a home for sick people, right? It's not for people that, um, you know, are healed. And right. are, so, so to me, um, that was particularly appealing in the sense that if you really truly understand what the church is all about, that is what it's all about, right? It's, it's not. Absolutely. That, so, so anyway, I, I, I totally understand. I think that a lot of people feel like that religion and certainly Christianity is unobtainable to them because you've got to be this kind of perfect person that doesn't do anything wrong. I'm like, Oh, definitely. That is not the case. Right. Yeah. It's the opposite <laughs> of the message, the real message of Christianity. Right. So, so anyway, you, you, yeah. uh, and I do, if, if you feel so inclined at some point, I would love to talk about your conversion and this, you know, I, I know the story about that obviously, mm -hmm. but, but let's get into the meat and potatoes of this. So you, you meet an exorcist. Yeah. And, um, and I started assisting him almost by accident. I was at an event where um, something happened that he had to respond to and I helped him. And then he asked me to continue helping. And then it was kind of a weird thing where once Pope John Paul told everyone to start appointing people, it was kind of like every time I'd move to a new diocese, I, I would just kind of be thrown in the mix with helping these priests. Oftentimes it was because they they had heard about my name and they'd say like, well, we've never done this before. Could you come and, you know, help? At that time, there were no schools. There were no, there were a few books, but most of it was like, if you wanted to learn about this, you'd have to know like medieval Latin. There wasn't a lot going on. Um, you could go to Rome and you could, you could train with an exorcist, but for the most part, there was not like a process by which that it was happening. And now it's a mentorship process. That's what should happen. And so, um, yeah, so I became uh, pretty involved nationally in, in helping with exorcisms and um, uh, in all different forms and all different formats. Um, I've been to many, many, many cases. I do a lot of intakes for dioceses and, um, what I do is, you know, try to determine who should see an exorcist, who, you know, what, what needs to be taken care of more with like a mental health professional, those kinds of things. And, um, and what problems just don't merit that kind of like intervention, that kind of thing. But, um, yeah. And now really what I do is just speak on it and teach on it at this time. So, so what was your first moment like? Because I mean, I can't even imagine, going and saying oh yeah i'll go and help an exorcist like yeah. that seems like yeah. something that i want to do right i mean even yeah. if you're no. like no. No, even if you're the biggest to, skeptic but right. we've all right. seen the movie right right we've right. all seen the right. movie yeah it's awful and people will say that to me all the time like i really want i'm really interested in this i really want to see one it's like no you don't like it's not you're there's no such thing as an innocent bystander in the room right like it's it's dangerous to so we're very careful about who's there. Um, but yeah, the very first time um, I was young, very young. And um, this case was to date one of the worst cases I ever dealt with. I mean, as far as like phenomenon that I saw and I was terrified, but I also knew like what was going on. I, I had enough knowledge of, from my family that like there is a battle between good and evil. And um, the most amazing thing that came out of this, I mean, I saw things that science could never explain, right? In that very first case, within hours of, of that very first case, I saw things that science could never explain. But when I walked away, what I remembered is the power of the priesthood, the power of the Blessed Mother. And, and I remember thinking, thank God I'm Catholic. I'm so happy I'm Catholic because those were the things that really impressed me. No matter what I saw in that room, those were the things that I walked away with that I just could not, I was in awe of it. I was in awe of it. So know? what did the priest say to you? So you go into this uh, exorcism. Do it, you know? I mean, was, did he already was, no, started no. it? Uh, I mean, no, what no, was the... No, no, no. It was, it was, it was actually a, a healing mass that I went to. And um, a woman who came up for prayer kind of started to manifest these terrible demons. And um, 
he knew what was going on. I, I didn't really have any idea. And he, at that time, had a relationship with the diocese where it was 100% on him. He didn't need approval to do an exorcism or anything. So he proceeded that evening to do it. And I helped him there. And um, I mean, it was awful. It was absolutely horrible. I felt so terrible for this woman. And um, I was just kind of thrown into it. Had he asked me, I probably would have said no, for sure. But the next day he called very next day and said, Hey, you know, would you help me with some more cases? And I don't know why I have no idea, but I said, yes. And that's what I would do. So, so what, how do you, so let's just take this woman initially with, you know, being respectful of, you know, uh, obviously of the person. So oh, yeah. the, the, they, they, they come to a healing mass because I'm presuming that family member. Yeah. By the husband. way, just to the audience, I don't know this story. Like th this yeah. is all fresh to me. Myself and yeah. Dave have never spoken about this. So that someone in the family figures. Her, her husband. Yeah. Her husband had brought her. Um, I mean, this is, this is the end of a 10 year journey. Basically they were trying desperately to get her help. Her family had ostracized her because of the symptoms of possession had become so strong. And he, without warning us, um, brought her to a healing mass. They had driven like seven hours to come to this healing mass. And, uh, I don't know why I still don't know the whole background of the story, but that's how it happened is he knew that something was going on and he just wanted healing. Well, uh, as often happens when a person who's actually possessed encounters an exorcist, the, the demons immediately kind of take over and, 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 and they start dialoguing as opposed to the person. Okay. So, so, um, they, they respond. And, and usually I'm, I'm guessing probably the mechanism for this is that God is saying it's time. Like you're going to have this confrontation. Right. Now, the throw down is happening right now. Exactly. Right. Right. And so, um, or just they're compelled for some reason. And so that's what was happening. And, um, she eventually was freed and healed. And, um, but that night was so horrible. Um, mostly because it, it, Normally, like an like when I'm helping a new exorcist, and I always say like we pick the time for the fight. Okay, we pick it. We don't we don't respond to the devil. The devil we pick this time. It's kind of like you know in the old school books and movies, right? I'll meet you at the flagpole at three o'clock. You know we're gonna right, settle this. Right, right, right. You, you don't respond to to what the devil's like ridiculousness. And so normally you would do that. Now at this point, there were. 600 people at this mass, they were all watching and, and the exorcist was like, no, we're going to deal with this right now. And took her to a, a, a room off the, off the church and, and, and did this. So he felt that it should happen at that time. So that's not normal. So it was a lot less controlled than what normally happens in an exorcism. But um, so, so, so yeah, so she walks in, he immediately knows like this is, he, he, he didn't immediately know, but I could tell, you know, it was, it was a strange thing because now when I think about this memory, when she walked up in line, I watched her walk. Like, I mean, she was probably 30th in line. And I remember thinking there's something up with this lady. Like something is different about this. And I was standing next to him when he was praying over people. This is after mass had ended. And she, for some reason, came up and she stood and she faced me instead of him. And I thought that was weird. Like, there's something weird here, you know, that why why did she not – who would ever walk up to two guys and not face the priest for, yeah. for prayer? For the right? healing, yeah, yeah. Exactly, right. And um, he kind of, I think he knew, but he didn't say anything. And he made the sign of the cross and she just, like, turned on a dime and was, like, nose to nose with him. And he knew right then what was going on. And – and what, what was she? Was she speaking in tongues? Was she what? What was not the... at that point? Her eyes rolled back into her head, and he knew, okay, something's here that's not should that shouldn't be. He actually said that, and he put his hand on her head, and she bolted up to the altar, took a candlestick that was like this, and bent it into a horseshoe like it was. I mean, in, in front of yeah. everyone, right? It, I mean, it was just like you could hear the gas. So he said, you know, take her into the sacristy, and you know, and that's that's when she just went ballistic and went nuts and yeah so so 
Okay, it's on, right? So yeah. you yeah. you take her into the sacristy, and and again, I want to be respectful. I don't know how yeah. much you can and can't talk about these things, yeah. or um, yeah. but, uh, and so what's the process from there? So I was trying to calm her down, right? And and some people had come to assist me, and he came in and just did some normal prayers, did not do the formal exorcism. Um, and then um, at one point came and, and began, and I didn't know it at the time. I had no idea what an exorcism sounded like or what it was like, but began the formal ritual. And um, immediately her behavior changed. He was in charge then. When he was in the room, he was absolutely in charge. And it was a, a kind of amazing. It was almost like watching a, a, a naughty kid like turn into like a soldier after boot camp, right? Like it was like when I was in the room, she was doing everything she could to destroy the room to, you know, she was, was foul language, everything you could imagine. When he was in the room, she was terrified. She, she knew. And, and, and really? obviously I say, she, I say she, but I'm talking they. about the demons, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. Because you um, kind of think for, from, from the movies anyway, I'm, I mean, and I'm, you know, right. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about how guilty uh, people that make sure. films are, but, um, <laughs> You know, you think that, that, I mean, you see The Exorcist, which to me is still the most terrifying movie of all time. And right. I know it was based on a true event, uh, but it right. was a boy, not a girl. Right. Um, it, you see that and you think that the priest is in a lot of trouble, right, in yeah. those situations, right. Right. Right? right? But that's not the case, right? No, You're saying that's not no, the that, case. I would, say, I would say that of all the things in those movies – the, the weirdest, the most strange change from reality is that there's this wrestling match. And of course you need drama for a movie, right? You need yeah. that conflict. Yeah. So it's like, who's going to win the priest or the demon, the priest or the demon. That is the opposite of what I have witnessed. It, 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 it no one, no one wonders who's going to win when the priest walks into the room and, and Roman Catholic exorcism, if we can get like nerdy into theology Please. a little bit. Yeah. It, it, there, there's, there's a, a strong theology behind it that's more than just deliverance. It's more than just the faith of a priest saying, be gone, Satan, in the name of Jesus Christ. Roman Catholic exorcism is set up with in such that th the power of exorcism belongs to the bishop, okay? And so the bishop can lend his apostolic authority for the express purpose of exercising the possessed, okay? So that's the language they use. Now, what does that mean? What that means is no matter how faithful the priest is that walks in to do that exorcism, and he should be faithful, don't get me wrong, but the power is not coming just from the faith of that priest. It's coming from the church, right? If that letter exists, what it means is this, that the entire bulwark of holiness of the church is brought to bear on that spiritual attachment. So when he walks in, he walks in with the angels, the saints, the faithful, all of us together. It's not just him. And that's kind of the genius of the way Roman Catholic exorcism is set up, uh, that it it's, it belongs to the bishop. And he is very clinging to that authority, right? Because it's an important ministry and it's the entirety of the strength of the church that's brought to bear. So there's never any question, you know. Yeah, and, and Dave, for the people that might not know um, or actually disagree with, because, you know, I have a lot of friends, uh, you know, friends in Christ that, that are not Catholics. Oh, sure, yeah. But how, how would you describe the apostolic um, uh, order that they have, the apostolic um, authority that the Catholic Church teaches? Just, just so that people can understand that you can disagree with it all you want. That that's not the point. Right? Sure, sure, yeah. The yeah, point yeah. is to understand why, uh, sure. that why Catholics believe this. Sure. Okay. So we would believe certainly that our bishops are descendants of the original apostles, right? That apostles appoint apostles, right? And that that's what they are today. They represent the apostles with Peter as the head, and we still have the Petrine office, right, under the Pope. Those are very important things. And we would say that the fullness of the authority of the priesthood of Jesus Christ lives within the bishop. Okay, So deacons, priests, bishops, all of those have some authority. But the fullness of the authority of Christ uh, to reign on earth lies in that bishop. And, and uh, of course, the way to understand all of Catholicism, that's confusing, right? Catholicism is confusing unless you really understand the incarnation, right? The incarnation 
changes everything for us. Um, when Christ took flesh, the world became a sacramental reality, right? And so these men are living sacraments. And so um, rather than a, a hurdle to jump over, they're more of a focus, right, to, to Christ. And so that's the way we would understand that, that authority. Um, and their stole represents the authority of Christ. So like in an exorcism, the demon's always kind of trying to get their stole off. They don't oh, like really? it. Right? They don't want to pull yeah. it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's the, yeah, it's the so, yoke. So, so you're, you're in this room. Yeah. He says, all right, it's, we, we, we're going to do this, right? He, he doesn't say anything. He oh, he just doesn't say that. Ritual. He just starts ritual. He says, everyone responds to the litany of saints, and we do. And he starts it, and he, I think, I think if I, if I had to, like, watch a video of it, he probably didn't use the full ritual, but he was using plenty of it and got to a point where he felt like, so this was hours, right? This happened over hours and got to a point where he felt like, okay, it's late enough and we've done enough that we should go ahead and stop this. And he kind of like started to slow down a little bit, pulled her out of like the trance that they often go into. And then we met with her subsequently four or five times and she was, she was fine. So really, so we took that one, Really, the one big confrontation to right. make it happen. So, right. so not to be they're bullies. Uh, they're bullies, Matt. Like demons are bullies. So, like they, you pop them in the nose, and then you find out who they really yeah. are. Yeah. Okay? And so, in possession, they've no one stood up to them for a long, long time. So that's what you know. Yeah. Well, and I'm sure that they love the fact that people don't take it seriously anymore. Right. Right. Because right. Oh, they yeah. can just run free and do whatever they want. Um, right. So. I want to ask this. I know it's like a little bit kind of um, sensationalist, right? Okay, but sure. Yeah. <clears throat> it's important for people to understand that these things do manifest themselves physically okay, um, yeah. in, in the real world. So in this particular instance, what was what okay. did you see? Okay, so let me answer it by saying this. <laughs> um, first of all, everyone involved in this case is deceased, so I'm, I'm, I'm free to talk. Okay. About it, and I'm not using names, obviously. Um, but uh, the the four signs of possession that the church looks for there's there's three main signs, and then that kind of adds in a fourth that that is not necessarily possession, but a lot of a lot of different demonic issues. The first is this preternatural physical abilities. So that could be levitation. It could be super strength. Um, it could be crawling up a wall, something like that. Okay. Um, it could be distortion of the body in some way. If you saw the movie, um, uh, if you saw the movie, uh, that just came out, sorry, I can't remember. I feel bad that I don't remember. Um, there was a, a depiction of possession. He was in prison. Um, I feel terrible. Oh, Anyways, uh, nefarious. Nefarious. Yeah. That was like when he's hurting himself, that's a very typical way of, you'll, you'll see a lot of that yeah. kind of thing. That, yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. Um, so, so preternatural physical abilities. The second would be um, clairvoyance. So they know things that they shouldn't know. Uh, the, th the third would be knowledge of unlearned languages. Um, so for instance, like one of the exorcists that I've assisted outside this country, he's, he's a language scholar, he speaks 12 languages. And I remember watching him interrogate this boy who looked like he had come from a mud hut. I mean, it was like, you know, never any schooling or anything. And he asked him 12 questions in 12 different languages. And this kid could just perfectly with perfect grammar, with perfect everything respond, even, even ancient Greek, ancient Latin, Hebrew, all of those, you know, so that would be the third. And then the fourth that the church adds in would be um, an aversion to the sacred. So if, for instance, you know, if they are terrified of priests or we use a lot of relics, you can see them behind me here, you know, relics, things like that. We might, we might hide a relic under their seat to see what happens or something like that to, to determine that. And they know, right? Because they, they feel yeah. it, right? If it's, if it's real, they know. Yeah. If it's real, they know. And, and it's, it's kind of amazing how you, you can see the response, you know, of, of these little manifestations of grace. Um, and in that case, um, all four signs of possession were there. All four signs of possession. So there was, there was clairvoyance. Um, you know, I, during the session, made the mistake of whispering something to the priest, and 
she knew exactly what I was saying. And she knew she, you know, preternaturally could hear or had some sort of like, you know, knowledge of what was going on. She was using him. She was using Latin, all of these things that she had never learned before. And her husband was there. So did she know, you know, and, um, and of course she bent that candlestick. I mean, she was 65, you know, maybe a hundred pounds when we met her. Like, you know, I, I could never bend this candlestick, you know, and, she, and that was in front of everybody. Right. So it's like, they yeah, saw a it. lot of people saw it. A lot of people saw it. Yeah. Yeah. So, See, yeah. yeah I, um, you know, I know that a lot of people, um, and they'll say that people that have, if you watch any interviews about exorcists, yeah. they'll say that, you know, you have to be, you know, for, for Catholics, certainly you go to confession, uh, before you start, um, an exorcism because they know, and they'll start saying stuff that they just cannot understand. Like, you know, your deepest, darkest secrets, they'll, yeah. like, they'll yeah. pull out in front of everybody. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I I have a it's a very embarrassing because when I was five years old, I went to the Natural History Museum with my dad and I wanted this little yellow pterodactyl and my dad wouldn't get it for me and I stole it. And I feel bad saying it, but I was five, you know, <laughs> and it has come up on numerous occasions. Really? Yes. Yes. And it's embarrassing because I say like, well, I'm I'm 40 now. This was like, you know, 35 years ago, just so everybody knows it wasn't yesterday. Right. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. Like, you know, you stole that. That right, yellow right. pterodactyl, and you're right. like, if that, listen, dude, if that's the worst thing that comes up, exactly. then you're doing right, right, just right. Yeah. fine. Okay, yeah, good point, good point. Uh, you, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, they will, they will certainly mess with you. you have, that's why you have to be so careful about your mental health in particular, like your emotional health. You really want to be careful because they're so intelligent; they know how to get you. Yeah. So, um, so this happens. You see multiple different manifestations of these things. By the way, uh, it. I do want to ask you, because people say, well, what is possession? Um, okay. Because there's three different, right? Is it three? There's possession, oppression. Yeah. yeah um, the, and we've... if you can talk about that a little bit. Sure. About those... Sure. So extraordinary demonic activity happens on a spectrum. But in order to be able to teach about it, yes, there's three levels that we talk about traditionally. Well, there's four, really. Okay. So the obsession or vexation would be when a demon is attacking your mind in an extraordinary way. And it, and it usually um, presents itself as uh, a prolonged temptation and an in, intense temptation. So for instance, somebody who thinks like, well, I want to, I want to kill my best friend or something. Okay. Now we've all wanted to kill our best friend at one point or another but like a person who's obsessed, right? Um, they won't be able to eat. They won't be able to sleep. They can't stop thinking this this thought. It's like driving them crazy. And the demon doesn't necessarily want to uh, want them to kill their best friend. Not necessarily. What the demon wants is for them to get to a point where they're in total, complete, just mind numbing. Uh, they, they don't know what to do. And what will happen at that moment is a, a choice will be presented to them, right? The demon will say, I can take this away from you if you do this. And they'll kind of operate with this carrot and stick sort of relationship. Mm -hmm. and, and they'll try to gain more and more of the person's like cogitative process, like you know, their, 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 their control. Uh, and as the person gives up more and more of their will to this demon, at least perceives that they're giving up more and more of their will um, at some point, we would label that possession. And and the point that we would label that possession probably is if there, if a demon's able to take over the person's body um, and speak as if it's animating that body, then we would probably call that possession at that point. Now, it, it, is there like an exact line? No, we can't, it doesn't mm -hmm. work like that, but certainly that's, that's warrants um, like intervention from the church. Later on, people started to realize, um, and this is Father Gabriel Morris, I think, who finally coined the phrase, um, something we call oppression. And oppression is like the story of Job, right, where demons are attacking the outside, like a person's health, the person's finances, but in an extraordinary way, okay? Uh, you would know, right? Something is, something is up here. It's more than just a bad day. Um, so there's oppression. And then the final thing would be infestation. And an infestation is when demon or usually a group of demons takes over a, an object or a place. Like or, a house. Or, or, like a house, right. 
Right. And that's really, really difficult to deal with. I would say infestations are really hard to deal with. Demons don't like to give up places. And um, in particular, they don't like to give up places. There's something about the pride, I think. And then, um, of course, like a house can't cooperate like a person could, right? So like in, in possession, there's still the person there. And you can tell them about Jesus Christ and his victory on the cross. And they can start to cooperate with this process, you know, so. And is there, um, you know, it's funny, uh, a few years ago, uh, a friend of mine, Tim Clemente, who's a, a, a really great writer, he was in the FBI for many years, and I will have him on the show, cool. um, but he is a very, very good writer, and he wrote a screenplay um, based on exorcisms and about a priest that uh, works with the FBI and goes oh, around yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. and, and, and he, he, he confronts uh, evil. And it's kind of like, you know, um, was it Scully and Mulder, Mulder yeah, and Scully? You right. know, and, and there's the skeptic that's like, yeah, this is ridiculous. It's, you know, it's right. just hocus pocus. Um, but, and, and I read the script and it is unbelievable. Like it's one of the best scripts I've read. And, and I said, Tim, I really want to do this. Like, this is great. Yeah. And he said, no, 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 priest told me, don't do it. Like, don't do yeah. it. And I was yeah. like, why? He said, because you're opening up yeah. an area that you probably do not want to go into. Um, when someone is possessed like this woman, did you, in that particular case, go back to a moment where the opportunity arose that she yeah. let that demon in? Uh, and what is the normal, um, the normal process? that you find is that is there a common thread is it ouija boards is it you sure, know sure, sure. you know that that you know talking into a mirror saying things but you sure. know what is that because people need to understand uh what they might be playing around with right okay so so to back up a little bit to give it context um <clears throat> uh, demons are very legalistic they know their they know their rights they, they're very legalistic okay so if they have the right to attack a person, they will attack that person to the extent at which they have the right. Okay. So in, in or, all of us are born into a place, a fallen world where demons have the right to attack us through temptation. Okay. We can either explicitly or implicitly give demons rights to ext attack us extraordinarily. And if they have those rights, they will. They'll they'll do what they can, at, at whatever God allows. Basically, they'll they'll attack us to the extent that they're. Because that's allowed. important, right? Like they are allowed to do it. So yeah, you know, before you go any further on that day, sure. like yeah. they are given license to do that. That's what you're saying. They have these parameters. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Why? What? Why? Okay. Why would people? Why? Because <laughs> people say, well, you know, what kind of a God is that that allows demons to attack people? Why would they sure. do that? And then. I'm sorry to segue a little bit, but why no, would no, they do right. that? No, no, of course, of course, sure. First of all, angels and demons, like the battle between angels and demons play a, a role in our test here on earth, right? Like if, if, you, if you go to heaven, it is because you fought your way there, okay? We are at conflict. We are at war, okay? That's what we believe about the faith. So that's part of it. Second thing is persistence in that battle increases our merits, right? When we stay faithful to Christ, Similar, this is similar to the question of why would God allow a child to have cancer, right? Yeah. Because we live in a fallen world that's compromised and evil exists because of sin, okay? Um, is it because of a personal sin? No, that doesn't, that's not what we're saying. Like humanity exists in a state of sin, right? And that's the way it works. And so evil exists. And when we persevere, when we face these challenges in the light of the resurrection, we receive grace because of that. And I, I would put demonic attacks in that same category that God allows us to happen. Now, what I would say about these extraordinary demonic attacks, very often, very often, we see that there's some kind of plan here, right? That God allows this to happen. And oftentimes, lots of conversions come about through this. Sometimes vocations come about through this. Sometimes, like different things where people witness this battle and because of their seeing this, they they have this conversion that happens. And we'll, so we'll see like a little bit of a plan there. And then finally, I would say most of the time with extraordinary demonic activity, 
people are explicitly seeking these relationships. And so it's kind of like, you know, if you're going to touch the hot oven, like you're going to get burnt, right? Like that's part of it. And so that that's part of this, you know. So, so. Do, do you see that like, you know, when people think that it's just, you know, theater, you know, they'll go out and they'll do, especially like, you know, in music or because, I mean, you know, we all grew up, I think, you know, hearing, you know, don't play the record backwards and, right. and all that kind right. of stuff. Right. Yeah. But do you see stuff because there has been a rise of it. There's been a rise of this kind of, and a lot of it I think is just pathetic. It's just people wanting to shock. But do you, have you seen anything you've gone, oh, hang on a minute, like that is really not good, like that, that, that that has the or the hallmarks of something real, um, for in your experience, you know, like what you've seen. Because for us, we just watch you know, it's a stupid like rapper with horns on, or yeah. uh, because I know some people go, well, hang on a minute, like that is that is satanic, like that is a real thing. Yeah, I'm I'm very nervous about uh, the climate, particularly with music right now. Um, because music is spiritual. It comes from someone's soul. And so I'm, I'm very nervous about that. Uh, what I would say is that, and, and I don't mean to like make it seem not as bad as it is. It's horrible. It's horrible. Like when you see a, a, a person who's seemingly Christian, all of a sudden taking this weird, dark turn. But what I would say is that Satanism is secretive. It's, it's usually not something you practice publicly, okay? Like real Satanism, okay? Um, the Satanism that I think these people are practicing is a a rebellion against Judeo-Christianity norms, right. these kinds of things. So I, I, I wouldn't say it's as spiritually dangerous, but certainly it's a, it's awful. It's evil, right? I mean... Well, you it, open the kinda, door, don't you? You do, you, do, you do open the door, even if it, it's unwitting. Right. It's kind of funny t to me because... Right. Like we, we, we just eat this stuff up, right? We love these people. We listen to everything. We buy everything. We do all that kind of stuff. And, and it's kind of like this weird relationship where it's like, you realize like Satan hates you, right? Like if you yeah. love Jesus, he despises you. And when a person espouses themselves with this person, with Satan, they become part of that band, right? That they don't like what you believe in, what you stand for. So it's this weird thing. For me to, to watch. Me, to me, it's never made any sense because, you know, you, 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 all you have to do is take, you know, Christianity 101 to look at, you know, what like what Satan's MO is. And yeah. it's never going to be good for you. Like, right, you, right. You, you, might, you might have, like, your little part. Right. Um, but eventually it's going to be bad. But I do want to ask you this because yeah. I think it's really, really super important to reiterate. I like you, we're not touchy-feely Catholics, right? We're not like, oh, you know, this, this, all of a sudden I got up and I felt grace and I felt fantastic. And, right. and I, I walk around on, you know, like Ned Flanders, I, I'm, I'm not Ned right. Flanders, ugly, ugly. Right. I'm, I'm not, right. That's not right. me. Right? right. So it's really important because and it's even talking about this. And I want to make this clear. Even talking about angels and demons to me is strange. Right. I, I haven't like fully kind of grasped that, but yeah. I know. Right. Yeah. It's like, I, I know it's like trying to comprehend the fact that the universe is is never ending and it keeps expanding. Right. Or like, you know, there's redshift and all this kind of stuff. Right. Like my little pea brain cannot comprehend it, but I know it to be true. Right. I right. know it is true because I've looked at the alternative arguments and explanations and they've all come up like massively short. Right. So, so you said at the beginning, um, you know, you're the same. It was very much a logic and reason thing for you. I mean, I, I know, I know that you had kind of a very interesting experience at the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I know that, and and if you want to talk about that, then please do. But um, I think that the reason why you you know you say there's a lot of conversions when they see this is because you are told all throughout your life have faith. Have right. faith, have right. faith that this isn't something you can you can touch or see or feel. And, and what we've kind of done, I think, um, you know, it's it's that great line, right? That the the, the devil's greatest accomplishment is making you think that he doesn't exist. Doesn't exist, right? Um, and 
multiple times, you know, because people say, well, this is mental illness, this is this. But there is a process uh, to go through uh, to eliminate the mental illness issue when tackling someone that might have, you know, uh, uh, some kind of possession or certainly some kind of demonic involvement. And then you right. get to the things where you go, hang on a minute, like you said, this cannot Right. This is unexplainable, you know, like, uh, can you, sure. can you speak to that? And then I sure. also want to talk about um, a little bit later about the difference and what, the difference between angels and demons. I know that sounds ridiculous sure. and why it's real. Like why to you, when was the moment, because you can know it in your head, but when yeah. was the moment that you were like, whoa, this is tangible. I'm seeing something, okay. right? Okay. Sure. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. The first is this, and, and I get this, this is the number one question I get at my events. Cause a lot of times at my events um, that I travel with, I get people from like the local atheist club. I get people from the local pagan club, you know, all that kind of stuff. And very almost accusatorially, right. They'll say, well, you guys are telling these people they're possessed, but really they need mental health problems. Okay. First of all, I would say I'm more skeptical than anyone I know. Right. Like I, my job is usually to prove to a person that they are not actually possessed. Okay. Second of all, I have no expertise in the psychological sciences and don't claim to have it. We use experts. We, that's what happens is that in many dioceses, right? They have a, a particular psychiatrist or psychologist that they send people to. And they want to know without a doubt that either one, there's a clean bill of health mentally. Or two, there are mental health issues, but there are things that we absolutely cannot explain through science. And most of the time in, in America, you are not going to get an exorcism unless you have that, right? I mean, yeah. it's not like well, they're going to go through a very rigorous process. And sometimes it's more than one people. When I'm helping a diocese uh, set up a team, for instance, I they'll say like, well, should we find some Catholic psychiatrist? I said, don't find a Catholic one. Find find a skeptic, right? Like we don't need any common ground for the devil to prove his existence. Find someone who's skeptical because you want someone who has that discerning process. We don't want to hurt anyone, right? And, and, and the exorcism process is traumatic. There's no question. We don't want to hurt anyone. We are much more skeptical than most people would be, I would say. Uh, whereas they think we're just admitting anyone who's, who has this. That's really not the case. But what I would say is this. It's a little bit of an unfair question because if you understand possession, right, that an entity is speaking to you uh, it preternaturally, right, without – there's no volume, right? You feel you're, – you're perceiving hearing it. That's a really dangerous situation mentally, right? So yeah. all of these people struggle with mental health issues as well. Um, so it's both and, right? Um, yeah. and, and And all of – by the way – when I'm working with a team, all of the cases that I work with, I always tell diocese, you need to require regular mental health therapy. Like they're, they can't just be getting exorcisms. They right. need someone to walk with them through it's this. damaged, right? I mean, I mean, yes. you, you know, if you, I mean, just imagine going through that. Like, firstly, right. imagine understanding that you are possessed or, or I mean, even, exactly. even if, you know, you have a manifestation in your house of a demon and imagine what that is to you to go, well, hang on a second. Firstly, they might not believe in this stuff anyway. Right. Right. So the trauma well, of that would be of huge on of it course. in and of itself. And right. then the damage, like you said earlier, like the, the, the demon will want to destroy that person's soul. It's not necessarily about, right. uh, about anyone else. It's about messing with them and right. getting them to it's a toy. Uh, spin it's a toy off. To them. Right. Yeah. It's a torture. It's torture, right? I mean, and, that, and that's this is what why, they're like, doing. Oftentimes, parents will call me and they'll say, well, this weird thing happened with my son. And it might be a very young person, right? And they'll say, well, I, I remember hearing that you should just command a demon to leave in the name of Christ. And I would say, don't do that, right? He's eight years old. Like, you don't need to, like, we don't need to do that. Like, give your son a hug, right? Like, that's what you need to do, yeah. right? Like, you don't, like, don't let him think that this is a problem, Right. Um, because you don't want to damage them in that way. Like this is a scary situation, but we're very careful about this. Um, it, you, you are not going to get an exorcism in America without serious due process. 
what I would say about that is sometimes it's a disservice, okay? Because I could meet with someone and because I've been doing this for so long, I know how to tease out a demon, yeah. okay? And if I see someone, for instance, do something preternatural and know that a mental health issue cannot mimic this, then I have to say, I'm sorry, you still have to go see this psychiatrist. This yeah, you got to go through the process, right? And they yeah, might, yeah, yeah, they might even be put on drugs. I mean, it could be a year long thing, right? Before they finally get back to where we are. Um, thankfully, the church has more sanity than the culture. And the church has this little line that says a priest must have moral certainty okay, to proceed with the exorcism. Now, that means that if a priest knows that this is happening, and maybe a psychiatrist says, well, I'm still not sure yet. But if a priest has seen things that the psychiatrist hasn't seen, he can proceed if he needs to. But in America, um, you're it's going a to go through a very country. rigorous. It is. It's it is. a litigious country. So you've got to be super yeah. careful. And, and Lawyers you know, are involved, everything. Yeah, I mean, the church has, has had its issues, right? right. Uh, it right. doesn't right. really necessarily need another uh, exactly. another lawsuit coming its way. Exactly. So, so yeah, so you... What you saw the woman bend the candle. What other things would you say that you have seen, if you can talk about them, like maybe uh -huh. nebulously, but sure, yeah. tell people. And and when was the moment like you're like, uh, okay, I'm I'm seeing this now, like regularly, or you might look and say, well, this is very, very, very serious. Like I know that this yeah. is going to be a tough one. And and uh, have you in sorry, there's a bunch of questions here. Have you encountered the devil? Uh, okay. Is there a, a hierarchy of demons? Okay. Um, and, and, you know, not there's a, you know, legion, right? There's, there's a, there can be a manifestation of more than one in one person, right? Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So the first question, I, I, what I'll answer is this, is that there was a moment where the reality of the supernatural community that we live in became just uber real. Right. I, I understood this battle between angels and demons long before this happened, but I didn't really understand the interplay between heaven and hell and angels, demons, saints, souls until this moment when um, I was doing an intake for a diocese, meaning that I was going to try to determine if this kid was actually experiencing spiritual manifestations. And um this 18 year old kid was brought in. His uncles were just these huge firemen and he, they had him arm in arm and he was foaming at the mouth and screaming the F word. And they brought him into my office and I had this big office at the time. And he was sitting on the couch, probably 20, 25 feet away from me. I was sitting behind my desk and I started to ask him questions. I was trying to get him to calm down. So I was just asking him very mundane questions. Like, do you like to play sports? Do you like this? Do you like that? And he started calming down, calming down, calming down. And as I often do, sometimes I'll just throw in a zinger, right? I'll ask like a bunch of very mundane questions. And so I, I had said to him, like, do you get good grades? And he was like, well, I try. And then I just looked at him and I said, do you know how much God loves you? And just before I could even blink, I mean, I couldn't even go like this. This kid had gotten loose from his uncles. He grabbed a vase and he smashed it and he had it up to my neck before, literally before I could respond. And I thought for sure I was going to die. You know, I thought like, how is, how, how are they going to explain this, you know, to everyone? Like what, what's going to happen? And he looked above me and his eyes just changed. He, he absolutely just shrunk in terror, absolutely shrunk in terror. And he looked at me after a moment of looking above me. And he said, if that little Dago from Luca weren't behind you, I'd have killed you three seconds ago. And I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was the strangest thing, you know, what's that all about? So he, he was obviously admitted for an exorcism <laughs> eventually. <laughs> yeah. And every time I'd walk into the room for the exorcism, the demon would start screaming about this little Italian girl that would walk in with me. And then we would all be like, what's going on? You know, what's going on? After weeks of this happening, the priest finally got annoyed and said to the demon, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to tell me who it is that walks in when Dave walks in. And after about 15 minutes of just interrogating this demon, trying to wear it down, finally, it, with gritted teeth, out came the words, Gemma Golgani. Gemma Golgani. Uh, Catholics might know. She's kind of obscure still, but she's gaining popularity. But St. Gemma Golgani 
was a modern saint who died in Lucca, Italy, uh, not that long ago. She died of spinal tuberculosis yep. and is well known, well known by exorcists around the world for intervening in exorcisms. I had no idea who she was. I'd never known. But she intervened in my life in a way. And that has happened subsequently with her tens of times. I mean, many, many times where it was very clear that Gemma was the one. She saved my life on several occasions in this ministry. And I I think at that moment, it was like, man, I learned about the communion of saints as a kid, right? But it was like colloquial to me. It was like this sweet thing. They were kind of like the superheroes of the Catholic Church. But I realized that this interplay between heaven and earth is real, right? That that angels and saints want to be a mediator, an uh, intermediary uh, in our life between God. And that God expresses his glory by saying, look, I don't need to conquer you with my finger. I can send this little Gemma Galgani, who was a poor, almost illiterate you know, girl from Lucca, Italy, nowhere really. Uh, to 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 intervene in these problems, and so that was really a, a kind of a wide awakening for me to the communion of saints and and the choirs of angels, like how important you know it is in our life. And, but it's it's very um it, it's very typically God. It's a it's a God thing, right? Because right. I mean, j- just so for people that don't understand, they might think that this is all hocus pocus. But and, and sure. I'm going to yeah. get to that. I'm going to get to that in a little while. Sure. Is that um in in the faith, you have, you know, um, Lucifer, who is a seraphim, right? So he's very, very powerful, very, very close to God. Um, defeated. No no, not, no, 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 no. Don't say that. Not close to God. No, no you, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, in, yeah, in, the, yeah. in the hierarchy yeah. of angels, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't mean close yeah. to God. Yeah, right. like that. What I'm saying is, in the hierarchy of angels, he's at the top, yeah. right? He right. was at the top. Right. So in... Yeah, I mean, you, you know what I mean. In the in the, the most perfect created being, yeah, yeah. Yep. In the hierarchy of that, he's at the top, which is the closest to. If you see what I mean, so then you go down sure, to an sure. archangel yeah. who is right the way down the bottom, right? right? Is right there. He's just one of. I think it's like the second, you know, order of angels, or whatever. Uh, you can correct me on that, but um, but God gives Saint Michael the power to go and defeat. Oh, okay. You see what I'm saying? So it's, sure. it's it's very common that God will take someone who is perceived to be like a small little girl from Italy and say, no, you can go and duke it out with the the most powerful of the demons and defeat them in my name, right? So Right, right. right. The love of God is what, yeah, fuels these things. And, and the, the classic example, right, is that, is Mary has total and complete control over the demons, right? Like the, the power that Mary exacts over the world of evil is breathtaking. Absolutely. Fantastically breathtaking. Like there, there's nothing like it I, that I've witnessed this side of the grave. And she was a poor virgin, right? Who was as humble as could be. I mean, there was no reason to pluck her out of obscurity other than God's spirit had prepared her for this battle. And so uh, that's what demons just despise Mary, absolutely despise Mary because they have no foothold with her at all. And so that it's a classic example of people love to set the drama of scripture up of like Jesus versus Satan, but very clearly right from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it is, it is Satan versus Mary. Right. And Mary lives in the victory of Jesus Christ, you know, the drama of conflict. And, and, and I'd just like to explain this as well, because, you know, since I moved to uh, Texas, it, it's been really amazing to see how people who are not Catholic, because I know I've got a friend of mine who gets very, very miffed when I say Protestant, but, you know, growing up in the UK, there's there's either Catholics or Protestants, and that's right. it. Like anyone other than right. Catholic is a Protestant, right. to, certainly in the UK, um, is that we do not worship Mary. Catholics do right. not worship. I'm going to tell you over and over and over again, Catholics do not worship Mary, but she has a very special place and always has done until... I mean, even Martin Luther, Calvin, you know, all the, um, right. Right. all the, all the people that split, you know, in the Reformation, they all had the same. Of course, it, it, it was the way it was. Um, the the teachings on Mary 
was the same for everyone back then. This is a relatively new thing. So when I try and explain to people here, because I get a lot, uh, uh, the interesting thing is I've had a lot of pushback when I, uh, my Protestant brothers and sisters who I love, and I've sat down yeah. with them and I've said, look, this is why we think this. And I'm, I'm a very like low information Catholic. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, it's not like I'm a theologian or anything like that. Very, very low information. Um, but when I sit there and I explain it like, hey, listen, look, you know, we don't worship saints, right? We don't right. worship idols. We don't worship Mary. And they say, well, there are these people. Yeah, okay, there are Christians that say things that are completely wrong in, in your faith as well, right? Just right. because they're, they're uneducated, they don't understand, right? But right. Can, can you just explain a little bit why uh, it's you know it's kind of funny for me as a Catholic like, because I've been through this process right I, I came back to the Catholic faith through reading Lee Strobel's Case for, Case for Christ and then I, I kept asking the question right and I did not want to become Catholic I did not want to become Catholic I was like no no right. no and by the way there's a lot of things that I still don't understand right there's a sure. lot of things I'm still kind of like you say not necessarily grappling with but it's there's a lot to learn. Right. And, right. and my thing is uh, logic and reason and the proofs for the existence of God is where my, where I live. Right. That's right. my that's my place where I want to understand more. Right. Because I think everything comes from there. Like I said, when I first found out about Thomas Aquinas's five proofs of the existence of God, that was the bedrock that everything was for me. My faith was built upon because it didn't rely on the Bible. It didn't rely on right. another authority. Uh, and to me, that was the most effective, um, uh, uh, persuasive thing for me to become a Christian was the fact that that was to, to talk about things in a philosophical, theological way, um, not relying on the Bible and, and those ideas, right. Being the most sensible explanation for everything. Uh, was a real moment, right? It, it was a real change for me. So I don't live in, again, I don't live in the touchy-feely world, but but when I I try and talk to my, my Protestant brothers and sisters about this, and they've been told a bunch of lies, um, right. and, and it's been perpetuated by pastors as well who were very, it's like they read the cliff notes on what they're, the person that taught them uh, what Catholics believe instead of asking Catholics actually what do you really believe? And, right. and 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 again, look. Just for the people watching, they'll go, "Oh well, what about the Pope?" Trust me, right? It, there's a lot of Catholics out there that zone the Pope out. It doesn't change his his authority. That that's a whole other thing. But can you please speak to the uh, uh, the communion of saints and? why Mary is so important to me. It's kind of like a crazy thing because, you know, she had to say yes. And, you know, without no right. Mary, there was no, there would be no Jesus. So uh, yeah. um, if you can talk about that for a second and, and why she's so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say for Mary in particular, understanding that like Catholics take our Jewish patrimony very seriously. Okay. So like, the Old Testament is very, very, very important to Catholics. And so uh, when we see that the Old Testament and the New Covenant are wed together in Jesus Christ, we don't just throw out the Old Testament. Like we want to be in the fulfillment of the covenant, right? Uh, and so we have to look at our Jewish history here and particularly the Queen Mother, right? If you've studied scripture at all, the queen mother plays a huge role in the people of Israel. Okay. Um, remember the, the Kings of Israel are kind of a mess, right? Uh, like we all are, but they're really a mess. When you read it, you're like, it's like a Shakespearean mess, right? Um, you know, you have Solomon with all those wives and David with all his wives and things like that. And, and because of that, right, it was unclear who would have the powers of the queen, right? Who would have the powers of the queen. And so the queen mother is actually where the queen, the powers of the queen would, would lay, would lie. And some of the powers of the queen mother are, are kind of jaw dropping. For instance, she had total control over the death penalty. It, it, her son could commit, con, condemn someone to death. 
she can intervene on the life of that person, which is kind of amazing, right? Uh, she was very much uh, involved in like the the distribution of the king's wealth, like those kinds of things, okay? And so when we look at Jesus as our king, right, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, he chose Mary as his mother. And we wouldn't just throw out the fact that he was in the line of David, the king of Israel, okay, and that he conquered and for all eternity, she's still the queen mother. And so we believe that while she's not divine at all, she was a creature, and we believe that um, she's not to be worshipped. And, and and you will never find that in any Catholic theology, the word worship, you know, with Mary, uh, that she is given a higher due than any other human because of her role in bringing about the incarnation, right? That, that, yes. And so we pray for her intercession. We do not pray to her, right? We do not worship yeah. her, but we ask her for her intercession the way you would if Christ were living on earth in a physical kingship, right? Uh, then you might go to the queen mother and ask for her like approval on certain things to try to get her to influence her son, okay, in a certain sense. Now, their wills are perfectly united. We believe that she was without sin. And so their wills are perfectly united. So uh, I, I think that for Catholics, it, we see her very much as our spiritual mother, but not our savior at all. Community of Saints, very similarly, um, again, we are asking for prayers. Just the way you would ask your family for to pray for you, we would ask them for prayers. We don't ask them to communicate to us. We don't ask them to, like, go against God's will or something like that. We don't believe in many, many gods, like in pantheism or Hinduism or something like that. What we ask is that those people who go before us, who are standing in before the throne of Christ would pray for us. And, uh, and that's what we believe. We don't worship them in any way. Some people take it too far. I mean, that's the problem yeah. right? is that in practice, there could be some superstition, but that's not what the church actually teaches by any means. Right? Yeah. And, um, you know, people say, well, it's not biblical. Um, th that's actually not true as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, especially about Mary, because, you know, if you look at the wedding of Cana, she's like, she's basically like, Hey Jesus, you know, whatever some wine. Right. And he's like, no, it's not my time yet. And he's and she's like, yeah, right. And right. he does it. Was a it. Very so real mother son relationship. It, right. it was. It was a, a mother and son relationship. And this is the most amazing thing, right? Like it's like if my mom, you know, I might say, no, I'm not going to do that for that person. And my mom calls me and she's like, Matt, yeah, right. You're you should do it. do it. And I'll be like, oh, <laughs> you know, right. and and you do it because you love your mother. Right. So yeah. anyway, I mean, yeah. I just wanted to clarify that because there's yeah, there's this sure. real weird kind of. No, I get it. I get it. And by the way, I've sat down with my friends uh, who are not Catholic. I'm not going to say Protestant, but um, and I explain them to this and they explain them all these things like, you know, we don't play, pray to, you know, idols, by the way. You know, God commanded Moses to, you know, make the staff and all. So, so there's this kind of weird thing where people go, well, it's not biblical. It's completely biblical. You right. just haven't asked the Catholic how, how they've, how the faith um, comes up with these ideas. Right. Um, and, and they're all biblical. You might disagree with them because you're, you're, you're pastor. And I always say this, you know, it's unfortunate that, you know, uh, a house divided against itself cannot stand, right? So, so what you've got is you've got people, and again, I'm segueing a little bit, but you've got people um, splitting hairs over things that were never a thing. And um, and again, I, I'd I'd ask people respectfully that that for me, the the absolute, um, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? A def defining issue for me was when I found out that there wasn't a Bible for over 300 years. Right. And so when you find there's not a Bible for over 300 years, the sola scriptura and relying on the Bible kind of goes out the window. You can kind of, you, you can come up with whatever explanation you want to come up with. But to me, you know, people go, well, it's this, it's that. I'm like, I, I, that doesn't make sense to me. It, you know, it doesn't make right. sense. The fact that sola scriptura isn't in the Bible. Anyway, and we can talk about this. I'm not, sure. you know, I'm, I'm urging uh, uh, Christians to, and non-Christians, by the way, just to look a little bit deeper and not take what people say someone believes as 
as given, you know, ask them what they believe. Ask them what the teachings of the church are. Um, right. you, you know, like I said, I mean, and I just want to say this one thing that I found very, very interesting about the link to Judaism, and that's why a lot of Jews, when they when they come to a Catholic church, they're like, oh, hang on a second, I kind of th this feels very homely this, right? to me. Yeah, like I right. kind of get it. Um, is the three the three legged stool the three legs of the stool right? Was it sa sacred uh, tradition, sacred authority, and sacred scripture all together? That's very very familiar to Jews, um, and and Catholics would say, well, um, you know, non Catholics do not have that. They have two legs of that stool at most, right? And right. and again, it doesn't mean that we're separate. But I what I've found is that there's a lot of hostility towards Catholics, certainly in the South. Uh, I, to a degree, I can understand it. I can understand it because people are very um, uneducated on their faith, right? right? They, they are. They're very uneducated on their faith. They don't know how to respond. Um, they, they do kind of fall into these kind of like, it's almost like a social club, right? Like, hey, jingly jangly. It's like right. for me, I, I, get a, I get a lot of into a lot of trouble for saying I can't stand guitar music in church. I, I cannot stand it. It's, it just grates on me massively. And a lot of people get offended about that. Um, so, so, you know, we have a situation, like I said, where you have God giving the most humble victory over these massively powerful entities. Um, to someone who would say that this is all hocus pocus, that angels and demons just don't exist, Right. Uh, or that, you know, there's this kind of mentality that they are these beings that have big wings on the back of them. Right. And, and the demons like have horns and a forked tail. Right. Um, right. How would you how would you explain what they are uh, and why they are um, in a to, to a layman, to somebody who just goes, this is just not true. It's, it's just not real. Why is it, why is it real? How can you show that it is real and uh, w without like necessarily? I mean, I know it's going to be kind of difficult uh, without saying, okay, th here's the authority of the Bible, but but why does it oh, make sure. sense? Well, well, interestingly, I mean, Saint Thomas does not use the Bible when it come when he's talking about a like proving angels' existence, right? He he clearly goes Platonic and and, and Aristotelian, like where th there like God is so far above us. So he proves God and he knows that we're real, right? There's a physical reality, but because of God's height above us, right? This isn't like a Santa Claus God. This is the unmoved mover, the uncaused cause, right? Um, that there must be some ratcheting in between, right? He starts with like a rock and he says, well, there's rocks. Then there's like things like single celled organisms. Then there are things like animals that with bigger brains and then there are things like that and it always gets up to humans and then there's this massive jump to god and he says you know rightly ordered there's something in between there there's something in between and the next level of perfection would be a non-corporal being right a non-corporal being something that's not because, limited by time or space yeah in because, the way we are in the way yeah we because are, so. because because just to just to qualify that a little bit more um, is that we have a human beings which are material and spirit, right? And so what he's basically saying is there's something above that, uh, which is what you were what you were about yeah. to talk about before I rudely interrupted you. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's all right. Yeah, and so I like actually the whole thing with angels, like catechesis on the angels, is something that's desperately lacking because most people know of angels what they see in pictures or paintings, or depictions. Okay, and it's important to remember that they are, again, going back to St. Thomas and St. Bonaventure, right? They are non-corporal beings. They have no physical reality. And so when we say like an angel is here, what we're saying is they're acting in the space, right? That that's there. Okay. Like we're not saying that they're taking up space. This is a metaphysical reality. This is why angels and demons and God and sexuality and gender is so hard for moderns because we've rejected metaphysics completely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but metaphysical reality demands that we would say like, right, there are these non-corporal beings. Okay. And that when we say like, it's, for instance, a powerful angel, what we're saying is that they're created at a level of perfection that is greater than a human. Uh, angels are, they're, St. Thomas said that they were each their own species. So it's not like you would see, 
for instance, like an, an army lined up and they would all look exactly the same and you would have that uniformity. It's not that way, right? They are created perfectly and totally uniquely. Um, and they aren't limited. They are limited by time. There's no question, right? Angels don't stand outside of time, but they're not limited by time in the way we are. Like they don't experience time in a linear fashion. So they're not eternal, but they're immortal. Okay. Um, fallen angels retain their their perfections, their natural perfections, so their natural powers, even after the fall, which is kind of scary, right? Because Satan was a seraphim, okay, very powerful. Um, and, and seraphim, as I was saying, seraphim. If you can, if you can just you know explain that sure, to people, sure, sure. So. What we believe about angels is that they are created at different levels of perfection. So not every angel is the same power, right? The nat natural perfection. And what we believe is that the seraphim are those who would be closest, right, to the throne of God. So seraph means a burning one. And they're on fire with the love of God, okay? And so a seraph would be what the word we would use to describe the most perfect of angels, okay? Uh, and we don't know how many there are or anything like that, but we know that there are many. Um and so, yeah, so they retain that power. Now, of course, like the love of God is what wins history. The love of God is what wins this conflict. So the angels who remained uh, obedient to God uh, are the ones who are going to win, right? There's no question there. <laughs> and we get caught up in that, in that conflict, in that battle. What I'd say is like um, people who are avowed atheists or reject the metaphysical reality of a spiritual world. I have found Matt that they are in, in the minority. Now, most, most people now, when I speak, they don't know much about it, but they know something's going on. They know that there's more than what we're seeing and they know that there's some kind of battle taking place. And I think that that's kind of, a, a good swing in our direction that people it may be swaying a little too far into the atheistic humanism, but most people see like, yeah, there's more to this than just humanity. There's more to this than just that. And it's not, like you said, a loosely held belief. It's a hard fought belief. Uh, well, there's something, something within that, us, right. That, that, right. that yearns for that. I mean, I, I said this the other day about the, the, these college protests, right. Is that, People are just desperate for meaning in their lives. And, and right. I think that the, the, the strange thing about this social media phenomenon where everyone's like, chikuch, 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 you know, taking pictures of themselves, other people are like, this is just massively narcissistic. Um, right. There's got to be more to life than this. And we've really pushed the materialism and the nihilism to its, to its maximum. I mean, I don't know how much further it can go. Uh, because people are like, and, and look, I, I know this, I've experienced this. You're like, okay, if I just get here, then I'm going to be happy. If I just get this, then I'm going to be happy. If I just get that, then I'm going to be happy. And you realize, I look back at, uh, at my, like I, I said this before, my grandmother, who had no money, um, she used to clean toilets for a living. And she was the happiest person I knew. Uh, and, right. and you're kind of like, well, hang on a minute. That, that kind of flies in the face of everything. So what is happening right now, I really do think, is that you've got to be careful what you wish for because people have been you, – you know when you struggle for something and your, your purpose is kind of in the struggle, and then when you get past the struggle, you're like, right, hang on a second, do I have any purpose anymore? We, we're not only we're we seeing that, but we're also seeing that <clears throat> these kind of like what-ifs are coming true, right? right. Because it's kind of it's, – it's almost kind of okay when it's over there and I, I, want, I want this and I – you know, I want, and I'm not going to go into it because I know YouTube will probably ban me or certain put a strike against me. But, but be careful when you get when these things are enabled, and these things are getting enabled because people are having the victories, right? And there other now people are going, oh, hang on a minute, uh, I didn't really think that that was what was going to come from it. And we're all like, we've been trying to tell you that these parameters are really, really important to stay with it, right? It's right. very, very important. It's not about like restricting someone's rights. It's about look that there's there's a you know there's a reason why people say don't there's a fence at the end of a building or there's a you know there's a fence at the end of a, a, a on the on the edge of a cliff. It's like because if you go past that, right, you yeah. are subject to laws of gravity and you are going to die, right? So right. the restriction is for your benefit. It's not it, it, you know we we need this in our lives. We need certain parameters, right? And we we used to recognize that. 
And now we're like, no, everyone must have what nope. they want and, and just give them what they want because then they'll be happy. Well, actually, they don't end up happy. They end up more miserable. Right. They right. end up being more destructive. And, and, and then, but what you don't want is a kind of like totalitarian swing the other way uh, where man comes in and says that I'm going to impose these restrictions on you. They all, it all has to be in context. And whether people like it or not, that this is the way it was for a very, very long time. And we function just fine. Um, unfortunately, there's always going to be uh, the human soul, which is capable of doing great evil, right? And, and I think, you know, you and I know this. We look and we say, well, uh, I understand that people are going to do evil things, right? I don't think that you can legislate evil out of someone. No. I don't right. think that by, by putting these these certain restrictions on there's always going to be someone that i mean that there's nothing that's going to stop us from going outside tomorrow and committing a great evil it's our own moral uh compass that stops us from doing that in effect we have the right to do it um but we understand that there there are these um rules that we can unwritten rules that we live by which again um if there is no higher order if there is no definitive good Right then, all we can say is that that evil thing is something that we do not like. We can't call right. it evil. We can't call it a definitive something that's definitively bad. Right, even though we all know that objectively it's bad. And why do we know it's better? Just a quick example. I'm going to go and rant here about this. Is the Nazis when they went out and they they justified doing what they did because it was it was basically survival of the fittest. If you're the stronger person, you want that house, you go and take that house. You know, you go and override that person. You want, you know, that, that car, you go and shoot that person and take that car, right? Well, when the Allies went into Europe, guess what? They didn't turn around and say, well, okay, you're stronger than us, right? That's survival of the fittest, so we should die. No, they started saying, hang on a second. No, no, they started appealing to what was right, right? What, how someone should be treated. Well, oh, that's really convenient, right? Because really living by your own rules, you should be, uh, okay with someone coming in and killing you because you're just like, well, it's the Lord of the Jungle. Of course. Right? Of course. It's, it, what, what are you appealing to? You're appealing to doing the right thing? What does that mean? You weren't appealing to that before. So even in their dysfunction and then wanting to justify uh, subjectively what they wanted to do, objectively, they know that there's a higher order, that, that they appeal to that, that ultimate good, and people don't really think about it anymore. And, uh, and again, forgive me for, for this little rant. It's why, no. why, for example, if someone tries to trip you up, right? If you, you're walking down the street and someone sticks a leg out and they don't trip you up, but they try to, you're indignant about it. You're like, well, well, why did you try and do that? Well, they didn't do it. Right. So right. why are you mad? Well, it's the intent, right? So, so, but if someone mistakenly like bends down and they stick their leg out and they trip over you and you get, you smash your face. You might get hurt. You know, you might have your face bloodied, but you go, Oh, it's okay. It was an accident. Intent matters. So, so that appeals to whether something is right or wrong, whether it's good or evil. And we know this, right? Because when it becomes personal to us, we start appealing to that, right? So we know that there's something outside of, the rules and regulations that come down, but you know, laws should re sh laws should reflect a morality, right? Uh, 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 virtues and morality that are, that are universal that we can all agree on. They don't always. That's why you can say a, a law isn't necessarily moral or just, and, right. and being moral and just sometimes means breaking the law, right? right. It, that, that's just the way it is. But we have this appeal to what is good. Right. We have we have this appeal to, and people kind of just dismiss um, uh, any kind of supernatural phenomenon. Right. By saying, well, you know, it's it, I can't see it. I can't I can't touch it. But you appeal to it all the time. You, you know, you reference it all the time in your right. life, even though you don't reckon you might not recognize that's what you're doing, because uh, because if if there isn't a higher order, if there isn't something that is bigger than us, if there isn't a. a um, supreme, or say supreme being or a higher, a higher power, right? What are you appealing to? Or, or you could say is like over the years of evolution, right? And this is another thing people say, well, you know, it's just because society has formed us like this. Well, it's clearly not true, 
right? Because right. if if society formed us like that, then what the Nazis did was, you know, they could argue that it was okay, and we all know it wasn't okay, right? And even right. they know it wasn't okay, right? right? Because right. when they started getting held accountable for it, then they they appealed to this other order. So anyway. Uh, my, my little rant is over, uh, but, but that's what, you know, for me, when I started really deeply thinking about these things, and, and for years I was like, no, 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 not religion, no, no, it can't be religion, you know, that's like, you know, made by man and, and, and all these other ridiculous atheistic arguments that, that you know, are, are, are very, very flimsy, right? They're very, right. very flimsy. And so when you start talking about, Angels, which are these massive metaphysical beings that are massively powerful, that have knowledge at their creation, right? Like so, so we go through life, and and we, we learn, learn things as we go along. We 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 process. They are given full knowledge at that moment, right? The moment of creation, right. boom! They have full knowledge, and they have free will, right? So th so they're created with free will. And just, you know, people, and again, this is my very, very base fundamental understanding of this, because even again, I want to reiterate to people um, that by saying it, I understand it to be true, even though I'm not feeling it. Like, I'm not sitting right, there going, right, 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 oh, right. yeah, I'm totally on board. It's just because logically, it makes sense to me. It, you know, it makes sense. Uh, I don't, again, I wish I lived my life every day like there were angels and demons. I don't. I, 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 right. I, very few of us do. You know, I always say this to to people who, you know, uh, do we really live our lives like our souls are real and they're in danger and that there's a god and there's a devil and that there are angels and it? No, we don't. Not like very, very. Even the most pious people don't. Right. Even the most pious people don't. But so you, you, we have this, we have this kind of hierarchy, and that's what I meant. Like I said, you know, when the seraphim are so near. Uh, I mean, it's still like you know, massive a massive distance, but as close as uh, yeah. the 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 top the the top kind of level um, towards God, so that you know these guys are uh, these entities are massively powerful, and so they can choose. They have the choice, right? So they're given the choice to either follow God, and you think, well, of course you would, because you can. You're in his in the beatific vision. Right, like you know, God's there, but they no, no, some of them no, no. choose. No, 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 no. It, they, they, they weren't created with the beatific vision. Oh, they no. weren't. Okay, no, so, no, so there no. you go. I'm, I'm wrong. I stand corrected. No, it's good. No, they're created in the heavenly places, but they weren't created with the beatific vision. They were tested before uh, given. Okay, that. and 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 most of the fathers of the church agree that the test was a revelation of the plan. Right, like that. Right, that the word would become flesh. That Jesus would take flesh. Right, and and. You could imagine, right, if they're at that level of perfection, they don't like this idea of the word, right? The logos, the yeah. wisdom, right? Taking flesh and becoming, in a sense, less than them, right? Uh, they couldn't understand the genius of the incarnation. So, yeah. So, but, but, so when, so when, I'm, when they are created, they're created with full knowledge, right? Full knowledge. Uh, it, yeah. Right. Yeah. So maybe my, my terminology was wrong. Uh, that's no, no, why I've you, got a proper uh, a proper theologian yeah. on with me, so that they, they have full knowledge and they can still decide to reject. Right. So Th they that's have, what I meant. That's what I yeah, meant. They can yeah, still yeah. choose, even though they yeah. they understand. Because like us, we don't. We, there's nothing tangible for us. It really, I mean, there is if you if you really want to look at it, but we've come away from it. But you know, for them, they have the full knowledge. Of so things. right. So what what's important about the full knowledge that you're bringing up is that that makes the character of their choice permanent, right? So it, we're humans, right? The, the demons hate flesh because flesh gives us time, right? right. We can one minute say I'm going to follow God, and the next minute not follow Him, and the next minute say I'm sorry, I want to follow you again, right? Um, demons don't have that luxury, or 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 in a certain sense that cross, okay? Um, so the the nature of their choice would be diametric. It would be permanent, right? So they are immortal. They will never die, but they can't choose one day to be a good angel and choose the next day to be a bad angel. There was one choice uh, and, and they live in that choice in a sense. Right? And then, so the question would be why, why would they choose that? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, 
so the, the the answer is the same reason we choose it. Okay, that they they decided they wanted to determine their own future, right? And so Satan sees the perfection that he has created at and is enthralled with it. And this is a mystery, by the way. I mean, no one's explained this perfectly. St. Thomas goes as far as to say there was a flaw found within them. He doesn't say that it was created. He doesn't say anything like that. They, we know that they had free will to choose. And when Satan sees this, um, he, he wants to choose his own destiny, right? And um, does not particularly like the fact that uh, Christ will take flesh and that they'll have to serve the, the the word of God right the as as a human and that's that's too a bridge too far for him so um, yeah the the small t tradition of the church is that he says I will not serve non servium right so so what is their mission okay so they want to catch us into that rebellion and that's what their entire existence is to catch us in the rebellion of God against God. And um, they will do that. I mean, basically, really simply for the most believing person out there, their goal is to have us estranged from God and dead as soon as possible. Thankfully, God limits their power, right? God limits the power that they have to be able to attack us in that way. So they can't just, for instance, get us in, in serious sin and away from God and doubting God and then just kill us. That's not the way it works. But they'll do whatever they can to move forward to that agenda. Um, and so that's what they want to do is they want us to be with them in that rebellion permanently. And the only way for a human to be in rebellion permanently, truly permanently, is is to die, right, in that rebellion, to die in that, that serious rebellion. So, Yeah, so the, I mean, the, the whole thing is just incredibly fascinating to me. And I think that, you know, again, one of the biggest victories – that evil has is they've kind of made this, you know, the devil has made this into kind of like a um, mythological kind of yeah. mumbo jumbo that isn't real. And again, again, listen, I want to, I want to reiterate it. I, I know this to be true. It doesn't mean that I feel it in every single of part of my body, but of absent of any other adequate explanation. <laughs> and, and right. if you really want to be, um, I think a, a lot of people hear this and they just they 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 just can't conceive that there's this other world or, or that this this thing is going on. But if you embrace it and you start looking at it through those eyes, all of a sudden things make a lot of sense. Right? It's just like everything, it's kind of like, it's like you know the, yeah, the beginning yeah. of the Transformers movies where it goes. You see this all this like. You know, right? And then all of a sudden, you see the words, and you're like, "Oh, okay, I see this." Right, right, yeah. And I would say, like, I sympathize with those people. I, I honestly, I, I very much sympathize with people who they just cannot comprehend it because there are still things I see that I have a hard time understanding, like under explaining. But what I would say is that, like, look, I, I'm not asking for blind faith. I, I wrestle. Right. Like that's what that's what you want to do is to wrestle with it. The other thing I would say kind of to your point is, you know, there's this classic line to kind of give people a little bit of hope. Right. Because demons are vastly powerful. But there's this classic line in the movie, The Patriot. Do you ever watch that? The Patriot with Mel Gibson. Yes, I did. Thank you. Kind of takes as a, a, as a Brit. UK people. But, um, <laughs> as a former Brit. Uh, yeah, right. Right. I figured, I figured, but there's this scene where uh, they're talking about this general who's just amazing Cornwallis. Right. And, and uh, he's like, you know, pride, he's definitely prideful. Maybe that's our weakness, right? They're trying to hope for this weakness. And somebody says, well, I'd prefer stupidity. And he says, pride will do, you know, I think what we're witnessing now is pride will do right. Like for the weakness of the devil, right? Like he is overplayed his hand in yeah. my opinion. He, he, People ask me all the time, like, do you think it's more evil now, like, than ever? Is Satan, like, releasing more demons, more lies, all these things? And, and, and there might be some truth to that. But I think, truthfully, he, he way overplayed his hand. When you have things in reality being rejected that can be proven by a kindergartner, right, uh, that's – he overstepped. He thought he had the yeah. control that he doesn't have, and he overstepped, and – 
I, I see a lot of hope in that, right? That our, for our culture that no reality, some, some sanity has to come back right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you see things like Russell Brand and, and watching Russell's yeah. trajectory has been, and his journey has been utterly yeah. remarkable to me. I mean, yeah. And you know, there's always going to be skeptics, but you know, you and I know, uh, certainly for me on my journey, uh, you can tell authenticity when you see it. Right, because right. there's no upside for him to be exactly. saying what right. he's, he's saying. He's going to lose but, so many people. Right, exactly. Of, of course he is, and I think right. that what a lot of people are doing right now as well. I mean, you got people that say, "Well, you know, he's a grifter." Is he's something like you guys don't understand? Like, if he shut his gob and went and carried on in Hollywood, he'd be making millions of and millions, course. millions of dollars. Of course, there's only downside for him in right. in doing what he's doing, unless it's authentic. Right, unless right. he really believes it, um, and and so so that's one thing you've seen him. You've seen uh, Jordan Peterson's wife, am amazing. That that is, if you guys haven't seen, it, it's an amazing story. Candice Owens, uh, you, you've seen a lot of people, and like you say, people people now are going, hang on a second, this is just I'm miserable. Like there's something right. more, and then unfortunately, the church and Christians are terrible, terrible. <laughs> at getting the message over, like, right. you know, and, and one of the things that drives me bonkers is, you know, so uh, I'm a, uh, I was born and raised in the UK and we tend to use kind of colorful language over there, right? The colorful language. And I think that there's, what we don't do enough, and I say we, I'm talking about Christians, yeah. people of faith is we tend not to pe meet people where they are right? right we tend not to come and go okay well i understand that about what this person's doing just leave them leave them be right, right? like let them right. get on with it right. they, uh, right. you know the the person that guided my journey uh, as a priest called father willie raymond is a holy cross priest um never ever 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 said hey matt you shouldn't do this he was just like, mm hmm Yeah. And he let me go on my journey. And I'm so grateful because I'm one of those guys, if they would have said, you know, you got to do this, right. I would have been like, oh, you, you what? You're not telling right. me what to do. You know, um, it's yeah. funny because I see that in my kids as well. It's a major yeah. problem. I'm like, yeah. I'm so sorry that I've given my kids this kind of like stubbornness. <laughs> but, you know, it's a process. And I think that it's like with Russell – uh, you see him on his journey and that, you know, he did something with tarot cards the other day and people, oh, you know, Russell Brand and tarot cards. I'm like, leave him alone, right? right? He's right. going to get, what he doesn't need is right. a bunch of Christians, which by the way, uh, one of the things that again drives me bonkers is the hypocrisy because the majority of people that are coming out like pointing the finger at him are doing all these other things behind the scenes themselves right like of so course. i'm sorry i'm broken i'm in no position to be lecturing anyone else on anything thank you very much right. um so i i think that we we do a lot better if people just l left us alone and and understood the process like you know it doesn't mean that you're not there or you might go hey you might want to think about this, but like, so for me, I, I've been told a couple of times, you know, you're not a real Christian because you dropped the F-bomb. And I'm like, I don't want to be a part of whatever church <laughs> that is, right. right? Because what you haven't looked at is, you know, I have a bunch of kids, you know, I've come out of Hollywood. I'm doing my best. I'm, I'm do, you know, I've broken the, the um, cycle, my dad, because my dad wasn't in my life, right? So I've been married now 19 years this year. Uh, instead of looking at all the things that I've done to change my life, people kind of like hyper focus on the things that you right. aren't doing, yeah, and, and that is a, that does a massive disservice uh, to to people. And to be honest with you, I can understand why people walk away. Me too. I, Me too. I get it. Me too. I, I think I think it's a common theme in my life that people will Google my name and immediately place a label on me. When in actuality, our home is a place where atheists, same-sex attracted, pagans, I mean, they all meet here because they find something, right? Because we we love people and we love people no matter what. And that's a important part of our family culture is that we're a home for other people. And I think like people automatically assume like, oh, they're just going to be these, I don't know, 
very judgmental. Know, like, like, uh, 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 yeah, yeah, closed off to society. When in actuality, most of my friends are far outside of my bubble. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that that's really, really important um, for us today. Yeah, I had a friend who died about eight years ago of AIDS, and he was he was a major, major leader in like the gay marriage movement. He was a big, big funder of like pushing for gay marriage, like when the states were all changing their laws. And I remember talking to him one time because I obviously have Catholic beliefs on that topic, on 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 the body and and God's meaning for sexuality. And uh, we were talking one day, and I asked him, uh, you know what do you think about this? Like, I mean, you and I became such good friends, you know, and like, it just seems like Christians are so judgmental and, and, and the people in, on kind of your past life put this label on Christians that they're judgmental. And so it gets cemented and everything. And he would always say like, culturally and for your kids, you got to fight like hell. And personally, you got to love like heaven. That's what he would always say. That was like his phrase, you know, and I, we always like really took to that, that we, yeah, I mean, my kids are going to know what right and wrong is. There's no question. And people who come in contact with us know what we believe, but we love people. And that's the way you win people. You know, it, it's, it's a massive misconception, right? It's kind of like, oh, you hate me. You hate right. me. You're a, right. you're a phobic. You're this phobic. Right. You're like, no, I'm not actually. No, I'm not at all. all. Right. I might I might disagree with you know X Y Z wh whatever right. it is and that's okay, right? right? Let's have a discussion about it. But right. it doesn't mean right. that I don't love you. It doesn't right. mean that that it's it's no. it, 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 and I think what it is is it's coming from the other side. It's the way that they see you rather than the way that that's, you see I, them. I, I absolutely believe that. Absolutely and then people go, oh, you know, you're angry. You see this on Twitter all the time. They're like, oh, well, you know, why are you so angry? I'm like. I'm angry not angry, <laughs> right. actually, at all. You know, I'm, right, right, right. I, I'm not angry. I, I, yeah. I, I, I just, I, this is what I believe, and we can have a discussion about it. You know, uh, a friend of mine who who is, you know, massively respectful, a guy called Alan Roberts, he's a, uh, you see him on YouTube, he's an atheist. And he's, he tweeted something the other day. He's like, look, you know, I'm an atheist, I don't believe. And I have, by the way, I have a lot of people that, that in my life that are atheists or, you know, they certainly don't agree with the Catholic Church, that's for sure. Um, but he said, you know, we really need Christian morality in right. the world. Like it's, right. it's a, right. the world is a better place for it, right? And, it, you know, I, I love the idea that, and this used to be something that we could do all the time. I disagree with you, but let's go and have a beer. Like, of course, it's OK. You know, we can disagree. And, you know, I have this kind of, you know, within my own family, um, certainly with my mom, my mom gets very worried because she was like, oh, you know, Matt, you know, you're saying these things. To me. I'm like, uh, I, I love people. Right. Just because right. I disagree with something doesn't right. mean that I hate. It doesn't mean that I want wish harm on them. I just disagree with them. And, and a lot of the time it's not just on opinion. Right. It's it's because of the consequences of what they believe, what will come sure. from that and that it's a sure. greater yeah. evil. Right. So you have to it's incumbent on you to stand up and say, hey, look, this is wrong. Right. right. Like this is wrong. And here's why. And very often when you and we've seen this a lot, like, you know, we've seen this a lot with the protests on campus. Right. People are going up and going, what, what are you protesting? And they go, uh, the the the, the uh, and you're like you haven't really thought this through right okay i have thought this through because i'm taking a stance because it matters right it's not right. just some right. it's not like you know i'm going to fly a flag on my profile on x right because you know right. Right, whatever it might be um because i want a virtue signal no it's because i believe that this is fundamentally damaging to society as a whole Right. Yep. Uh, it, and, it, and it really matters. And it's because actually I care about you. This happened and, and I can't talk about it on YouTube, but this happened with a certain thing that happened over the past few years. Right. Um, that I refused to part to to partake in. And I kept saying, hey, guys, I'm fighting this for you as well. Like for all the people that have done this thing and eventually it's, you know, I do believe that it's going to be uh, harmful to you. I'm fighting for you too. And you might disagree with me, but understand the motivation for it is good. 
it's not a uh, you know it's not rebellion for rebellion's no. sake so mm-hmm. so with that in mind i do want to ask you this guy i've kept you for for a long time i love this it went very very quickly um <laughs> Have you ever come across the devil? And and if you have, what is that like? And um, how would you describe that? And, and, and in addition to that, I'd like you to, if you can, say things that you've seen that are unexplainable, like truly unexplainable that, you, that if you, and, and, and again, I, I always wonder like why there isn't like footage of this stuff, you know, being the skeptic. <laughs> Right, yeah. but but let me ask you: Did you ever, like, said, do you ever come across the devil, and what have you seen that has been utterly unexplainable? So, uh, the the answer is I'm 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 not, I can't with one hundred percent certainty say that I have. I, what I would say is that part of the ritual is a, a priest demands that the demon ask their name. It's an optional part of the ritual; you don't have to use it. But that usually is a, a kind of a turning point in the case when a demon will admit their name. And demons always grandstand. So almost all of them say they're the devil or say they're Satan at the beginning. Interesting. Almost all of them say that. There have been times in one case in particular where it was clear to everyone in the room that something was was different, that the character of the entity was more serious. And that that demon did identify as Satan. Um, and it, it was just a feeling. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. It wasn't like the physical stuff. Usually the physical stuff is like parlor tricks, right? They're trying to see, can I scare these people in the room? Like, can I, can I do that? Or can I impress them or something like that? Um, and so this was different and it was clearly, and, and uh, clearly something the gravity was different, I would say, you know, as far as like mm-hmm. the, the situation in the room. And and a lot of people agreed with that, that it was probably Satan, you know? And so, so I don't know. I don't know for sure. Cause they lie constantly. They lie all the time, you know? And do, did um, you have someone that comes, you know, a demon that you meet often and they'll go, Oh yeah, here you go. I've seen you again. <laughs> right. Is, yeah, is you there anything that like that? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. You don't, you really? do not want that to happen. Yeah. Really? You don't want, I mean, you don't want them to, um, when I go into the room, right. I want to be anonymous and just sit in the corner and pray and not have that any attention drawn to me. Right. Um, but there are times when it's like, Oh, I'm so sick of this guy or something like that. Or like, I, I remember pretty vividly getting scared one time, getting startled and, this woman, you know, then looked real deep in my eyes and it was the demon, you know, and said, said, I scared you like, you know, and it was like, that's terrifying to me. You know, you don't want to yeah. be the subject of their, their thing. So yeah, there've been plenty of situations like that. And, um, you know, the, they try to test you to see like, how much can I scare this person? And so like, I, I remember one time in particular during an awful case, the case turned towards me and said at three in the morning, I'm going to kill you, you know? And at three in the morning, sure enough, my phone started ringing, you know, it was this crazy number from China. And I remember like just being so startled at the ring, like it was so scary, you know. And the next day I went back to the exorcism as soon as, as soon as this woman, you know, started to manifest the demon, the demon looked at me and said, I, t- I scared you last night. I scared you last night. You know, like, like she was like gloating in a certain sense. So yeah, that, that stuff happens. Um, I made the mistake of, um, you know, my, I mean, you know, my wife passed away not too long ago. And I made the mistake of attending an exorcism not too long after she passed away. And um, I should have known better. I, it was stupid. You know, looking back, I'm like, man, I've done this long enough that I, I warned priests not to do stuff like this. Why would I have done it? But the demons just, you know, immediately latched onto that. We were there. Really? We killed your wife. We gave your wife cancer, you know, this kind of thing. And I just had to remove myself from the room. So, yeah, things like that happen. It's really awful. Um, as far as manifestations that I've seen, uh, I want to be careful because I've seen all of those signs of possession. I've seen levitation, super strength, clairvoyance, knowledge of unlearned languages, and I've seen them on numerous occasions. Well, I, I hope that people take away from this that like, there's nothing as impressive as a priest who's 91 years old using oxygen and a walker 
that walks into a room where demons have preternatural strength, give you preternatural strength to this person. And the priest is the one who's in charge, right? That they're absolutely terrified of this little priest who wouldn't intimidate any of us. And I would say that that's like kind of the most impressive thing I've seen is the power of the church over this fantastically powerful metaphysical being, right? Um, so it's yeah, humbling, I'm, right? It's I mean, it it's it's really humbling it because we kind of like we 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 can get caught up in the you know certainly for a lot of Catholics who are like you know you've got these priests and they're really squishy and you know they have that right. you, you yeah. know what I mean you're like oh my right. goodness me like you know what are right. they doing they're running down the yeah. aisle you know doing all these stupid things disrespectful things and then you realize that you know these guys are warriors right that they, they, they are warriors. Uh, and yeah. certainly these these little yeah. ones, you know, it's funny because I, I met um, I've met Chad Ripperger a couple of times, um, kind of unassuming person, um, and you know you know that that he's been involved uh, in multiple exorcisms. There's a couple of other priests I've met that have been involved in exorcisms, um, and it, and it's humbling. Yeah. You know, yeah, there's so, no question. Yeah, the, I mean, the priest who I most often assist is the least. I mean, I mean, you would. There's no one on earth that would ever be intimidated by him. He, he is as he lo- sounds like he's going to fall asleep when he's reading the ritual. You know, it's like it's it, it, there's the least drama you could ever imagine when he's involved. But he is holy and he's humble and he knows he's not a hot shot and it works. You know, it works. So. Yeah, I think I think to me, and it's really important to focus on the good part of it. Uh, understand though, and recognize the bad, right? Because it's real, um, and I think a lot of people poo-hoo that. Like I say, they dismiss it. And right. what I was really hoping in this interview is to get someone who is just a you know someone who is relatable, because you know when you put the Roman collar on. You know, right. a lot of people are like, yeah, well, whatever. Of course, they're going to say right. that. And uh, but you know, yeah, I'm the opposite. Yeah, I remember watching yeah. a. Um, I'm the least likely person to be. It's really that. funny because I was watching uh, before it came out as a film. Um, it was a haunting in Connecticut, I think it was. Uh, you know that um, I, I watched. It was when I used to have Conjuring. cable. Huh? Yeah. I'm not sure if it was the, the country. It, 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 it was something. It was some. Because I watched the documentary on it, and it was oh, okay. um, this this couple up in Connecticut that were witnesses as well. They would be called in with the priests um, to to witness the exorcism and help in the exorcism. And I actually called my priest friend, and he knew them. And it was kind of for me. I was like, oh, this would make an amazing movie because it's just unbelievable. The story is unbelievable, and. And to, to, for it to be personal, because you hear about this all the time, you'll hear about exorcisms and, you know, the, there's the movies and this and that, and they kind of big it up. And, and of course, like you said, they dramatize it a lot of time, but, you know, because they kind of focus on the levitation, the crawling up the walls that, that you know, by the way, just so people know this, like spitting up nails, um, you know, that is the thing. Um, and what they don't focus on is actually the victory. Right, right. What happens, and and like you say, it's it's kind of a little bit unsexy, right? When you have this like little old priest come in with his walker, like you say, and his oxygen, and he's like slapping this demon down. It's way more uh, interesting for for an audience if there's this real physical tussle and the priest is getting thrown all over the place, and you know. Uh, um, but I think that what I wanted people to get from from our conversation is that you're a real person. Right. Like you're a real person. You're not some kind of like grifter. You're oh, not a, oh. um, uh, th- there's no kind of upside for you in this apart from, no. you know, actually helping people. Um, and so I really wanted people to kind of understand a little bit more that this is going on and that real people are involved and, um, and that you should really reflect on your own spiritual life more. Um, because like you said, I think that I, I've always found that when things have been really, really bad for me, I've become closer and deeper in my faith. I wish it wasn't that way. I remember like my, my, the prayer that I said for years and years and years, Dave was like, God, I want to know you more. 
And and you kind of think, oh, am I going to get up one morning and have this like revelation that I'm going to know all these things, and, and all of a sudden scripture is going to become, uh, you know, very clear to me, and I'm going to have this feeling in my heart that you know that that I. I get up every day with God's joy in my heart, and it just hasn't right. happened, right? It just, right. It just, right. It just hasn't happened for me. Right. Um, so it's it, what often happens, and is this is what happened to me was I had to get slapped down, right? Right. I had to go through pain to go. I've got nowhere else to go, right? I I, I don't know where I can go for some kind of relief. On this, some kind of inspiration, some kind of hope, and be careful what you wish for, because God will right. bring you to Him one way or the other, right? right. One way or the other. And right. so, like you said, with this, with this instance, uh, when you see these um, manifestations, like you said, there's actually a lot of good that comes out of it, right? right. And it's diff- it's Absolutely. difficult for people to understand, and and I, I think as well, you know, you say that like the problem of pain, you know, the 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 problem of evil. Certainly, you know, why do little kids get cancer? You know, it's it's kind of like the probably the biggest argument against the existence of God. But when you understand it fully, uh, it's actually not at all. It's it's uh, it, it makes things make sense, right? Because otherwise, how, you know, how can you make sense of that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a uh, there's no no question in my life. Like people will often look at our life because my wife passing away isn't the only tragedy we've been through. And they'll say, well, of course Dave believes in the resurrection because he really needs that. He really needs that. But in actuality, what I found is that people who are suffering, they're the ones who've actually wrestled with it, right? They're the ones yeah. who've actually, and, and, and the deepest, darkest moments when I knew Amber was dying, I can tell you, I was wondering, do I really believe in this? Like the, yeah. the resurrection of the dead. Do I really believe that Jesus rose from the dead? And and I thought about it more than any atheist or any professor or philosophy professor or something like that. And I've wrestled with it. It's, it's hard fought. You know? It's not a crutch. You know, a lot of people no. think it's a crutch. I mean, you know, it's, no. it forces you to examine every single thing about your life um, in depth. Right. And face up to a lot of things. Right. Right. It's 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 actually easier to dismiss it. It's easier to just oh, go, okay, so well, whatever. Easier. There is nothing. I would love and then, to. I would love yeah, to. right, right. I mean, this is what people don't understand. It, you know, it forces right. you number one. It forces you to live your life in a different way, right? Um, and and really be accountable. And you're like, oh, yeah. Mm, yeah. Oh, no, I can't. Right, like every every everything in my being is pulling me this way, but I know right. that that's not right, and I know that I'm going to be held accountable. Yeah. Um, and, um, and like you say, when, when things like that happen, like the, the sad loss of your wife, I mean, uh, I remember, you know, I knew when you were going through that and it was, uh, it, you know, for someone, I didn't know you then. I mean, it was, it was just, right. um, I mean, you put yourself in those shoes, right? That That's what everyone does. What would I do? Sure. You know, how would sure. I respond? Uh, and, and I think that like you say, you, you struggle with it, right? I mean, it's, right. it's a fight, it's a fight. And I'd imagine it's still a fight. And, right. and certainly for me, it is uh, right. trying to make sense of everything. So it's not a, it's not a crutch. And I think, you know, to looking at someone like Russell Brand as well, the, the, the amount of bravery that guy has, and people don't even see it, like, you know, the, the amount to come from where he was to authentically search for the truth, regardless of the consequences takes massive courage but just massive yep. courage and um you know like i said people think oh you know you're just christian because then you know you become christian and then all of a sudden everything's rosy no that's not the way it works at all <laughs> no. no remember saint Teresa of avila said said to god god it's no wonder you have so few friends because you treat them so poorly right <laughs> you know, yeah. so, so, I, and you know yeah. i did a i wrote a little play about mother Teresa. And I think a lot of people, I mean, look, I'm not even going to go down the ridiculous accusations that have, have you know, been leveled against her, which is just absurd. <laughs> but she never felt close to God. And, and to me, right. like, I can really relate to that, right? I really, right. really related to that. And so that woman's going out and doing God's work every single day in the, in the like, most horrible 
uh, conditions. Of conditions, right? right. And she never felt close to God. She had that one, like kind of one revelation earlier on in her life, and then she continued to do it because she knew she understood that that is what she had to do. It's not like this kind of like warm, rosy feeling inside, right? Um, and and you have to. Um, to me, that makes sense, right? It's you know, it's, I think Robert Downey was talking about like embracing, hugging the cactus, right? Uh, and that yeah, makes yeah. sense to me. Like, like pain, the pain and suffering kind of part of it makes sense to me. <laughs> you know, sure. the kind of like, sure. you know, yeah. uh, prosperity gospel part of it doesn't make any sense to me at all. Uh, right, so right. it's it's kind of an amazing, it's an amazing thing. So anyway, Dave, I, I, I want to thank you so much for spending such a long time. I mean, it's been two hours now. Uh, that yeah. You know, I looked down at one point, it was one hour 45. And I was like, that feels like that. Yeah. Like, it went yeah. so quick. So yeah. uh, I want to I want to thank everyone for coming along and listening to to what David said. Please, uh, he goes around the country. If you're in America, he goes around the country. Um, look into Dave. Do you have a, a website they can go to? Yep, it's the Catholic Truth about Angels and Demons dot com. The Catholic Truth about Angels and Demons dot com. Right. So even if you're not Catholic, it doesn't matter. Go to the website. Get educated about it. Um, Dave, thank you so much again for coming on the show. I've been I've been wanting to do this for a very long time, and yeah. uh, and and I'm just very grateful of you taking up this period of time to share your experiences and share your knowledge with the audience. And um, and I'm very grateful for you, and I'm very grateful for your family. You know, I love your brother okay. um, very much, and um, so yeah, uh, a, a big. A big thanks to the Van Vickles and uh, and thank you for spending time with me today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on.